every single time someone makes a video about how to buy a house, it ends up being this long, drawn out, useless video with so much information, it literally makes your brain wanna implode. So I decided to put together this short, simple video on five steps to be able to buy a house. We're gonna keep it simple and we're gonna address some of the most common questions that first and second time home buyers have, which is, are you gonna be able to afford your mortgage? Is it really worth it to buy or should you continue renting? Is your credit score high enough? And lastly, do you have enough money to put down and what types of homes should you buy and should you be renting a room in your house to help pay down the mortgage payment as well? So without further ado, let's jump into the first step, which is gonna be qualifying or talking to a lender to get pre-qualified for your loan. But the thing is, if you've been researching on Google or YouTube on how to buy a house, you probably already know that. Everyone tells you to get pre-qualified first. But here's the reality on why, and here's some must-follow tips that you have to use before you start talking to a lender. The first tip is to talk to a local lender. Look, if you're gonna be going out in a competitive market trying to get a good deal on your first or second time purchase, then you need a local lender that's gonna be reliable and ready to write the pre-qual letter on the weekends whenever you're touring for home. And not only that, the seller is gonna be verifying your financials with your local lender. The second thing you gotta pay attention to whenever purchasing a home or talking to a lender is gonna be you need to avoid those banks and credit unions. I know they advertise insane rates and sometimes it's too good to be true like Navy Federal Credit Union, but the problem is if you're in a very competitive market, 99% of the time, lenders at big commercial banks like Wells Fargo, Bank of America, or even Navy Federal Credit Union aren't gonna be able to close on time, aren't gonna be able to release the financial information about your loan to the seller to be able to actually get you the offer accepted in the first place. Look, I'm a real estate agent and I'm a top listing agent in my area, and every single offer that comes through on the sale of my client's house, I will physically pick up the phone and call that lender to make sure that they're able to close. If they're with a bank or a credit union, then I would politely request that buyer to switch their loan officer to someone local that I know and I can trust. One of the biggest things that I mentioned on before about getting qualified for a home, which is our number one top question by buyers that I get asked all the time, is are they gonna be able to afford their mortgage? And the answer to that question is actually a lot simpler than what you're making it out to be. Look, once you have a local lender or a local real estate agent working with you, you can pull out a list of three or four addresses, send them to your lender, and they'll run complete payment estimates as well as your total out-of-pocket expense so that you're gonna know exactly what you're signing yourself up for before you place an offer on a property. And to take it a step further, don't be afraid to go a little above what you're paying currently on a rent because you're gonna get the tax benefits at the end of the year. And one of the most asked questions is, is my credit score high enough? Now look, if you followed step number one so far and just gone out and at least had a conversation with the lender, they're gonna be able to answer that. But I will tell you from my personal experience, you can qualify for a home with as little as a 580 credit score. Now, does that mean you're probably gonna want to? Well, it depends on the situation. Since you're viewed as more riskier in the eyes of a lender, you're probably gonna have a slightly higher interest rate and you're probably gonna pay a little bit more fees than the average consumer at closing. But it is possible. I don't want you to think that it's not possible. So have that conversation with the local lender that's willing to take the time with you over the phone to explain the process to you and at least get you on the right track if you can't qualify right now. But I'm so confident to say it that 99% of the viewers that are watching this channel are probably able to get pre-qualified tomorrow. And for the sake of this video and keeping it simple like I promised, we're not going to dive into the complicated FHA, conventional VA, what type of loan should I get? Because again, if you do your research correctly, and you find a really good local lender, they're gonna take care of all the financials for you so that you don't have to worry about it. And if you're in the DC metro area or any of the surrounding states on the East Coast, reach out to me, leave a comment down below and I'll hook you up with a local lender that will take care of you with my guaranteed stamp on it. So we've gotten through a good chunk of the financial aspect or tips of buying a house. And now it's really time to dive into how to get a really good deal on real estate and identifying what type of property you should get. But before we jump into that, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel for more content to help you save money on real estate and start building wealth as well. All right, so tip number two, and it's probably one of the most important tips because most of the time, especially if you're working with an inexperienced real estate agent, as soon as you get pre-qualified, that agent's gonna push you out the door and start showing you home and you really just have no idea what you want in the first place because it's probably your first or second time buying a house. So what I want you to do is I want you to use these two apps, write them down, Redfin and HomeSnap. Those are the highest quality apps 
apps that you can use for finding real estate in your local area. And what I want you to do is I want you to spend the next week, yeah, that's right, seven entire days. And don't worry, it's not gonna be too overwhelming. You just spend 20 minutes a day browsing the local area that you want to purchase. What I want you to do is I want you to track how fast listings turn from active to pending, and I want you to see what the sold comps compare to the current active comp. Now, if that sounds like Chinese, what I'm trying to teach you is I want you to not overpay for real estate. So I want you to zoom in on the Redfin app and look at the sold comp, which will be most likely grayed out, and then I want you to look at the comps right next door or in the neighborhood vicinity of it that are active and compare those two prices. If you're seeing price differences in the townhouse section of like 30 or 40K thousand more than uh, the houses that have sold, then it's definitely a seller's market and people are pushing for price. So the whole point of taking these seven days after you get pre-qualified is to identify your price range and really look at what the market is doing in the particular area that you want to purchase because I promise you there's no real estate agent out there that's gonna take that much time to go over that with you and you need to really honestly just do it yourself to learn anyway. Now we touched on this earlier before but you need to send the particular addresses that you like in your price range to your lender so that you can get an idea of what the monthly payment is going to be for that house. So for example, at the bottom of your budget, say you find a house that's just mediocre, send that house over to the lender and then send the house that's slightly above your budget over to the lender so that you can see the cost difference in your monthly mortgage because believe it or not, a $20,000 price difference in a mortgage is really not a whole lot. I mean, you're talking like 50 bucks or so. Now this may seem a little bit basic, but this is something that a lot of first time home buyers forget, especially if you're coming from renting where maybe everything is included don't forget to factor in your utility. I know that square footage is so appealing whenever you're buying a house and you just want the biggest house possible most likely. Um, believe me, I do as well, but you also gotta understand that the bigger the house you have, the more maintenance and the more utilities that you're gonna have to pay. And if you're not getting a condo, you're gonna have to pay for gas, electric, and water most likely. So by this time in your real estate journey to buy a house, you should be on the eighth day. Or, you know, take as long as you want to browse around in your market just to get a good understanding of it. But right now is probably one of the most important steps of this entire process so pay very good attention to this because I can't repeat this enough. It's to identify if you want a fixer-upper or if you want a move-in ready house. Now let's compare the two on both sides of the screen. You got a fixer-upper over here. A fixer-upper is going to do a few things for you. It's going to have the pro of getting you a house below market value because again it needs work so it's not going to be at tip-top value. It's going to have the benefit of getting you all your closing costs covered which on the financial aspect as a quick breakdown your down payment and your closing costs are completely separate. Your down payment is gonna be the money that you put towards the equity of the property and your closing cost is going to be what I refer to as the trash that you wanna get the seller to pay for completely. Now if it's a fixer upper property, that means it's probably been sitting in the market for some time, doesn't have a lot of interest, it's below market value in the first place or you offer them below market value. It means you can tell the seller because you have all the leverage on this to pay for your closing costs. So your closing cost on a first time home buyer purchase of around 300,000 is probably gonna be 3%. And on top of that, just to double secure it so that you have the peace of mind of knowing exactly what you're going to come out of pocket with, you can always forward that address over to your local lender and they'll give you a full price estimate on your closing cost and your down payment and your monthly payment as well. But going back to the fixer upper part. So on the fixer upper part, the biggest thing that you're going to have is that cushion of instant equity. So say you find a house that's worth around 300k from doing your due diligence over that seven day period and you see all the comps are selling for around 300k, but you see this one priced at, I don't know, 290 but it needs needs a lot of cosmetic work. It needs updated appliances, it needs paint, carpet. It's probably just a little bit nasty right now. The pictures are taken awful. Well, say you can get that house for two seven. That means that house, once you spend the five to $10,000 fixing it up, is gonna be worth 300,000 and now you've made $20,000 of, I like to call instant equity. But it gives you that cushion because you never know what's gonna happen in the market. You may lose your job and at least you'll be able to turn around and resell that house or at least a slight profit, worst case scenario. Now on the flip side of that, you have have a perfect move-in ready house with the gray walls, the white cabinets, uh, the sparkly marble granite. Now that may seem all nice and stuff, but the problem with that is, is that if you buy that house, you're going to be underwater, especially if you're putting a low down payment for probably, I would say safely, five to seven years before you can at least break even. The reason why I know that is because simply if you look at the amortization schedule on your loan, especially if you're getting an FHA loan, that $1,600 or $1,700 payment on that $250,000 purchase of the that is only going three or four hundred dollars towards the principal alone. So do the math, how many times or how many months is it gonna take before you can pay down the principal to reach that 270 if you bought the fixer-upper deal like we talked about over here. Look, at the end of the day, there's no right or wrong choice of whether you want something move
move-in ready for your family or you want to do a fixer-upper property. I want you to know all your options so you can make the most educated decision before you go out and write a contract because that's going to be the next step. You've already done the due diligence, you've gotten pre-qualified, you're probably starting to view homes at this point. I want you to go out and I want you to write an offer on a property that you believe is going to be a good deal for you. Which brings us to number four and these are two of the biggest tips that I can tell you as a real estate agent in my market, especially a competitive market in Northern Virginia, to be able to take advantage of the seller and really get a good deal. And it is to ask for all your closing costs to be covered. Now, cash is king, and I've taught that a few times on some of my videos on my channel. Hang on to as much cash as you can because you never know what happens. And what that means is you're gonna want the seller to pay for all your closing costs so that you only come out of pocket your down payment and build instant wealth into the loan or mortgage of your property. Now, what does that look like? Well, remember, if your closing costs are going to be 3%, what you're simply going to do is ask the seller to pay a seller concession or seller subsidy of 3% to you at closing to cover for those fees. You're still gonna offer exactly what you think the house is worth and then just throw it out to the seller and let the seller counter back. I will tell you 99% of the time, the seller is probably gonna meet you in the middle, especially if it's a distressed property, and just counter up the list price. But remember what we talked about before, if you all, if you ask for 10,000 or 3% in seller concessions on a $300,000 property, then that seller is probably gonna just counter up to 305, still give you the 10,000 back, so you're out of pocket it doesn't change at all and you're still putting your normal down payment down and your mortgage payment is like barely higher increasing it from 300 to 305 but just save ten thousand dollars keeping it in your pocket just by getting the seller to pay for your closing costs now let's assume by this point you've gotten the seller to accept your contract your real estate agent has agreed to negotiate out the terms what I want you to do is I want you to do a home inspection no matter what it is every single property you do you need to do a home inspection for it and the reason why is because once you do a home inspection especially for a distressed seller that's been sitting on the market and it's in need of cosmetic work and you can drag it out and waste so much time so the seller is gonna have no option but to fix any repair request that you put forward. So for example, one of the biggest fears as well of buying a house that needs cosmetic work is you may not have that much cash to get it fixed. However, let's say you drag out that property that was sitting on the market for 45 days, you get it under contract on the 45th day and you drag it out for two weeks. You don't do your home inspection for literally two weeks. So by this point, that seller is probably getting really anxious paying two full months of mortgage payments, you can literally hit them with the bomb, which is asking the seller to pay for every single repair that's major or even cosmetic. And at that point, they're gonna have no choice but either counter back or go back on the market. And if they go back on the market, we all know how that picture looked. Took them 45 days to find you in the first place. Probably gonna take them another 45 days, if not long, to find another buyer. Not to mention, they're going to have to explain why the last buyer, which was you, pulled out of the contract. So it's gonna look bad anyway, so they're gonna have no option but to negotiate with you and at least meet you on the middle so you can squeeze every single drop out of that seller that you can to get the best deal for your first time or second time home purchase. Now that's how you negotiate real estate. Now by this time, you should pretty much be good to go to close if you can get through the beginning negotiations of accepting the offer and the home inspection. Everything else is a walk in the park, but you're pretty much gonna be going to closing. So the fifth tip or step in buying a house is to literally go rent a U-Haul or hire a cheap moving company to get your stuff into the house. Now a few tips on this, the expensive part of a moving company is going to be the hourly labor. So if you can get your stuff boxed up and all that moving company has to do is put it in their truck and move it to your house and then you can unbox, you're going to save a heck of a lot of money. And I literally completely forgot to touch up on the main questions that we talked about in the beginning of this video. So is it worth it to buy or should you stay renting? And the answer to that question is very simple. If you can get a mortgage payment for two or maybe even $100 more than what you're currently renting, that means you're going to get the tax write off. You're going to get the principal pay down, especially if you get a good deal. That means you're going to be saving more money every single year that you own that home and on top of that you're gonna get the tax incentive at the end of the year so it's a double bonus it makes no sense to continue renting unless you plan on living in this home for the next two years and then selling it I wouldn't recommend you to buy so how are you gonna know if you have enough money to come out of pocket for a down payment and the answer is super simple but it's gonna be kind of a vague answer so bear with me on this one you really just got to talk to a lender because the higher credit score you have the less out of money pocket that you are able to come because you're gonna be viewed as less risky in the eyes of the lender now you can't 
can't expect if you have a 580 credit score to get a 0% down uh, loan unless you got like a VA loan or something like that. And even then there are guidelines. So what I would highly recommend you to do is just have a conversation with the lender. Have them pull your credit because it's not going to hurt regardless. Even if your credit is bad, it's definitely not going to hurt at that point. And just have them put you on the right path to figure out which loan is going to be the best fit for you. Now working with a ton of buyers over my real estate career, I have learned that every single buyer wants more than what they can afford or more than honestly what they just should get. So for example, if you want a townhouse, you're probably going to be better off in a condo. And if you want a single family, you're probably going to be better off in a townhouse. I know you don't want to hear this, but the truth is there's certain advantages to buying a house and living below your means than there is to just buying the biggest house with the most amount of square footage, paying more for maintenance and utilities like we talked about earlier, and then just becoming house poor. So do your due diligence, take one of each tip type of property you want to buy, send it over to your lender, get the monthly payment estimate, and also consider that if you lose your job, are you going to be able to sublease this house? You can do that. Remember, you own the house. So if you need to rent out a room, is it going to disturb your family? You know, so you want to think for the future. Yeah, it might be slightly more expensive to buy a three level townhouse, but if you rent out that basement for maybe eight or $700 a month, that's going to make it less expensive than if you bought that two level townhouse. So food for thought right there. Think through the whole picture, get the estimates, talk to your real estate agent. If you're in the Northern Virginia area and you want a realtor or even the Maryland area, I'm licensed over there as well. Reach out, go to austinharleygroup.com. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, leave it down below and don't forget to subscribe and give this video a thumbs up. Thanks guys.